This is part five or um, implementation or taking action. This is where the plan of care actually comes to life. If you notice, implementation and taking action are both green because they are the same thing regardless of what terms you use. This is a step where we actually do what we plan to do to help the patient achieve their goals. When we planned our interventions, we took many things into consideration, but let's talk a lot more about those things. For starters, we have to take into account the standards of nursing care. We cannot do things we saw on TV or social media that look like a good idea. Sometimes people post things that are not within our scope or standards of care, and that sets us up for hurting our patients or legally hurting ourselves. We also need to look at what resources we have available to us, staff, equipment, and supplies. We may have the best ideas for an intervention, but no way to actually complete it. Some of our interventions may be collaborative, meaning they could have been prescribed by the provider, recommended by respiratory therapy or physical therapy, and some interventions may be purely based in nursing. Some departments, such as the emergency department and specialty units, have their own protocols that are followed for patients. We have to take all of that into consideration when we are taking action. Remember from the planning stage, these interventions are patient-centered, evidence-based, and directly relate to the problem the patient is having and the goals we set with the patient. And a big thing to note, as you move through the nursing school, you will learn more interventions and you will build this mental intervention list in your head that you can use for many different types of patients. In block one, you are learning the basics of plans of care. So we've broken down interventions into four different categories to help you. Before we break each one of these down, I want you to remember that we are doing these interventions with our patients. They are collaborative. And remember that our patients may not be alone. They have family and friends who might be part of the care, and sometimes we have to make sure they're involved with the interventions as well. The first category is assessment. What interventions can you do that assess the patient? When we think of assessment interventions, we need to think about what we should be monitoring or assessing. Think back to our pneumonia patient who is coughing from all the sputum so much he can't breathe. What assessments should we be doing on someone who can't breathe? Lung sounds, oxygen levels. Can we assess the amount and consistency of the sputum? Yes, we can. Can we ask our patient how their coughing and breathing is feeling? Yes, we can. Can we assess the patient's pain with cough? Yes, we can. We also need to think about how often we should be doing these assessments. We do have unit routines such as vital signs every four hours, where we know we must do assessments at a certain time, but depending on the patient's problem, we can always assess more frequently. But make sure that what you write down in your plan of care is appropriate. If you work on med surge and you write in your interventions that you will check lung sounds every hour, you will never have time to do that and you will set yourself up for legal failure. Remember, you document these interventions in the chart so everyone can see how often you said you would be doing something. You also have to consider what you will do with the data you collected from your assessment interventions. They must be documented, and if something is abnormal, you may need to contact the provider. The last thing to consider is why is the assessment necessary? For our pneumonia patient, is knowing what the lung sounds are necessary? Yes. How about the oxygen level? Yes, again. The second category is therapeutic interventions. These are interventions we do to the patient to help them with their problem. We can assess all day long, but if we don't do anything to help the patient, they will never reach their goals. If our pneumonia patient is on oxygen, we can make sure it's humidified to help the secretions not be so thick and hard to cough out. We can have the patient use their incentive spirometer to get good deep breaths all the way to the lowest parts of their lungs. We can administer um, ordered cough suppressants or expectorants. Besides what we are going to do, we need to determine how often it will be done. 
Humidified oxygen just needs to be set up and then changed when the fluid goes dry, but giving the patient order cough suppressants that have a time frame associated with them requires us to know what the order is and to follow it. We also need to know the why to what we're doing. This is such an important thing of nursing. Anyone can follow an order, but not everyone can understand the why behind the order. This takes knowledge you will gain over the course of your program and critical thinking. This why is what we call a rationale. In block one, we have you write down the rationale for your interventions in your plan of care to help you develop the knowledge and critical thinking. Next, we come to education interventions. These are interventions we do to teach our patient. I mentioned incentive spirometer use in the last slide. It's a great therapeutic intervention, but what if the patient does not know how to use it? We need to educate them. We may have to educate the patient on how to cough deeply and effectively to get the sputum out. Nursing does so much teaching that half the time we don't even realize we're teaching. Besides what we're going to educate, we need to determine how we will teach it. We need to discuss this with our patient to see what kind of learning style works best for them and also look at what type of education works best for what we are teaching. Some things can be taught by video or verbally or written, but some things may need demonstration with return demonstration. Incentive spirometer use can be very easy or can be very difficult. You may have to go back and teach the patient several times before they understand what we're teaching. So education is not a one-time thing. We constantly reinforce our teaching. We also need to look at the why for why we're teaching something. Sometimes we're required to teach things and sometimes the patient wants to know something. Either way, we need to make sure the patient is ready and willing to learn. Referrals are when we send the patient somewhere else for help with a problem. It does not mean physically send them, it's more metaphorically. Do we need to get physical therapy to come work with the patient for ambulation? Does the pharmacist need to come work with the patient on home medications? Does a patient require equipment or supplies at home to help their problem? Referral means we will get them the right people on board to help them with their issues that nursing can't. Remember, we're a healthcare team. Don't forget the why for the referral. We can ask for help from anyone we want, but there must be a need from it. That need is the why. That is our rationale. Sometimes nurses come up with the best plans of care and we have the best interventions all planned out, but it doesn't work out the way we expected. It happens, but here are some tips to help ensure intervention success. One, make sure you've worked with your patient to develop the goals and interventions. People don't want to be told what to do. They want to feel included in their care as much as possible. You will have the best chance of success if the patient is on board with your interventions. Two, modify your interventions to meet your patient's developmental, psychosocial, or pathological level. Intensive care unit patients will most likely not be able to participate in their care, but their family can. Pediatric patients may need their parents around to complete interventions. Third, Assess or reassess your patient before your interventions to make sure they're still needed. Patients change minute by minute and what you thought of an hour ago may not work now. Four, reassess your patients after your interventions. There's more on this in the next PowerPoint. Five, make sure your interventions are evidence-based. Don't be using things off social media. Six, use the whiteboards for communication of interventions. If your patient needs to ambulate four times today, make check boxes for them so they know how many times they have ambulated and how many times they still have left. Seven, make a date with your patient and do everything you can to keep it. If you both decided that the patient will ambulate at 12 o'clock, plan and organize your day so you can ambulate the patient at 12 o'clock. Eight, anticipate the unexpected and have solutions in the back of your mind. For example, if you're going to ambulate your patient, be mentally ready and expect them to fall and to know what to do if that happens. This is the end of this section. There is only one section left to go.